nada tienen de especial. Dos mujeres que se dan la mano, el matiz viene después. Cuando lo hacen por debajo del mantel, luego a solas, sin nada que perder. Tras las manos, para el resto de la piel. Un amor por ocultar. Aunque en cueros no hay donde esconderlo, no está tan de amistad. Cuando salga, pasará por la vida una vida que quede de nuestro bien. Una vida que quede de nuestro bien. Y lo que opinen los demás es lo demás. ¿Quién le tiene palomas al cielo? Con un patrón de suelo, mi cantante. No estoy yo por la labor. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, and uh, wow, that, uh, that video is very emotional for me and I'm sure some others who haven't been to Cuba for almost a year and a half because of the pandemic. And it's so good to see our friends and comrades and allies in that video. On behalf of the US Women and Cuba Collaboration and the Women's International League for Peace and Freedoms, Cuba and the Bolivarian Alliance, I would like to welcome you to the second webinar of our series, Women on the Front Lines, Cuban and U.S. Women, uh, U.S. Lesbian Voices. 
Our first uh, webinar was held in September to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Federation of, of, Federation of Cuban Women and the 20th anniversary of um, US Women in Cuba collaborations work with the Federation. Um, our third in the series will be held in January and will focus on the role of Cuban women and women internationally in the battle against COVID-19. And so we will uh, get that information out to you once we organize that. My name is Cindy Domingo and I am the co-founder and chair uh, of US Women and Cuba Collaboration and also the co-chair of WILF's committee along with Lenny Reeves. I especially wanna thank Deb Goldman, Moon Vasquez and Barbara Maggiani and others. Um, and those three are the core of our lesbian and allies project. And they were instrumental in developing and putting together the pictures for the video and the music that you just saw uh, that have some of the wonderful highlights of our work that we have accomplished and the lesbian groups that we have built ties with in Havana, in Santiago, Cienfuegos, and Santa Clara, and in other towns. And two of the Cuban women that are on the panel um, are a result of the many years of work that we have done with Cuban lesbians. First, um, I also want to acknowledge the co-sponsors of this webinar and thank them for their support and help in reaching out to many of you who may or may not know of our work. Now's Global Feminism Task Force, uh, Lilo, a legacy of equality, leadership and organizing, Code Pink and Gallatin's Valley Friends of Cuba. I wanna go over briefly just the program so you know what's coming up. We're hoping that this program will run about uh, one and a half hours and if there's you know, discussion, more discussion, we can uh, extend it for a few minutes, but we really would like to keep to our time of ending at 3.30 because of people on the East Coast. So after I speak, uh, I am going to uh, intro, uh, and I want to follow my welcome and introduction with a message from the Federation of Cuban Women. As you know, uh, Communicating uh, with the island is very difficult because of the blockade. They do not, they are not allowed access to Zoom. Um, and uh, so many of our, um, there will probably be, uh, there will be um, the message by the FMC is a message that I will be reading, but was written by the FMC. After the message from the FMC, Moon Vasquez, who chairs our Lesbian Allies project, will speak and give an introduction and a brief overview of the project. And then after she speaks will be a video of a poem uh, being read, it's a video uh, from one of our friends in the lesbian group in Cienfuegos. After that, Deborah Goldman, also a member of our National Executive Steering Committee, um, we'll introduce a video of Norma Guillard and then the panel with our Cuban and US women. And hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A and we will end with some action items that you can take to lift the blockade and to enable us to commute, uh, communicate better and establish our friendships with the Cuban people. Uh, and uh, lastly, if you would, uh, I don't wanna just leave this to the end, if you would like to donate to continue our work, and I'll put this in the chat, you can contribute through Venmo uh, and please mark it US, for US women. And it's Lelo, L-E-L-O capital, Seattle at Lelo again, dash Seattle. And I'll put that in the chat box. The genesis of our work um, with L the LGBTQ communities goes back to the very beginning of the US Women in Cuba collaboration and our delegations of women that we brought. As many of the women in our delegation were lesbians, there was both a personal and political interest in making, uh, in talking to other lesbians and sharing experiences about building movements against patriarchy and especially against homophobia and violence. 
At the same time as the formation of U.S. Women in Cuba collaboration, we brought to the United States, through the initiative of Catherine Murphy, who was also on our National St Steering Committee, two wonderful comrades uh, from the community of La Guanera, which is right outside of Havana, Fifi Bocart and Teresa Ramada. Fifi became a great inspiration to all who had heard her speak, but we were also intrigued by a film that was made about her efforts and others to be inclusive in her community. That film entitled Butterflies on the Scaffold talked about how Fifi and others in the community welcomed drag queens, singers and dancers and created in their community a nightclub for them to perform in. It was groundbreaking in Cuba. And Fifi um, was always one to talk about inclusivity and the role of women and others in the community in rebuilding their community. Uh, she inspired me and others because she said, the reason she loved the revolution was because the revolution loved her. In the early 2000s, it was difficult to find organized lesbian or LGBTQ groups or clubs. And it was finally through Norma Guillard, who is being featured here today, and running into lesbians and gay men in the park in Santiago. In about 2002, it was not till then that we were able to engage and start building relationships with these communities. Much has changed in Cuba, as well as in the world in relationship to LGBTQ rights. And so we felt it was important to focus our second webinar on this issue. As always, the blockade presents challenges to our work around Cuba and our inability to, in, to fulfilling our goal of having Cubans speak for themselves. So while Zoom allows us to converse with people all over the world, the blockade has made it most difficult for us to dialogue directly with the people in Cuba. And so that is the dynamic we find ourselves in this webinar as well as other webinars where we wish that Cubans could speak for themselves. Therefore, the poem that Moon will introduce and Norma Guillard will be via video. And I will also be reading a message now from the FMC. I want to thank our comrade in Venezuela, Osmar, for his work in subtitling Norma Guillard's video. This webinar is an international and intergenerational effort and I also would like to thank Amy Leon for her technical skills in running this webinar. So uh, if you give me a moment, I will uh, read the message from the FMC. Let me pull it up. Right. Okay, this message uh, is, uh, was sent to us uh, by the North America uh, International Office of the Federation of Cuban Women, um, uh, Gretel Morante who we have been working very closely with over the last few months. The message to US Women and Cuba collaboration. The Federation of Cuban Women thanks the friends of the US Women and Cuba collaboration for the opportunity to participate in this meeting. On August 23rd, 1960, the Federation of Cuban Women, the FMC, was consulted in an organized and massive movement of women. Since then, we have articulated our own project of empowerment as subjects of law with a profound impact on the entire society, politics, and culture. Following its, per, uh, following its uh, participate, participation mechanisms in 1972, the FMC established a multidisciplinary and intersectoral working group to create and develop a national sex education program. This initiative was intended to respond to one of the approaches expressed by women in their annual plenaries to prepare in sexual education, 
to better guide their daughters and sons and thus avoid the vicissitudes they had suffered. With this premise, the National Sex Education Work Group was born. The importance of sexuality education was recognized in the second Congress of the FMC in 1974 and in the first Congress of the Communist Party of Cuba in 1975. And since then, sexuality education was expressed in state policy, which recognized in the family and the school, the institutions of greater responsibility. The policies of the 1960s were expressed in new laws during the 1970s, among which the family code approved in 1975 stands out as a result of a broad process of popular consultation considered the most advanced for its time in the entire continent, it recognized the right of men and women to full sexuality and to share the same domestic and educational responsibilities. As a consequence of this policy developed during the 1970s, Cuba was the first country to sign and the second to ratify the government's commitments to the Convention on the Elimination of all forms of discrimination against women, known as CEDAW, and that was in 1979, a binding instrument which Cuba as a state party previously follows up. All over the world, the medical, psychological, social, and legal sciences speak out against homosexuality and consider it an example of disease, madness, moral decay, and deviation from social norms. Unfortunately, the permanence of institutionalized homophobia, homophobia in the first decades of the revolution has not been analyzed in all its complexity. This situation is taken advantage of by those who have only seen it as an opportunity to profit within the well-financed market of the attacks against Cuba. Given this critical analysis from our institution to practices incoherent with the humanist spirit of the Cuban revolution process is essential. Understanding the current situation of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and intersex <clears throat> people in Cuba, and the need to replace their attention as an object of politics requires being located in the historical evolution of the issue on the social agenda of the Cuban Revolution. The National Sex Education Work Group led by the FMC became CENESEX, the National Center for Sex Education in 1988 and has since then been located in the Ministry of Public Health. CENESEX's mission is to contribute to the development of comprehensive education for sexuality, sexual health, and the recognition and guarantee of sexual rights for the entire population. To do this, it develops educational and communication strategies that include different national public good campaigns. A significant impact on the mobilization of the social conscience of the Cuban population has been the initiative to celebrate the International Day Against Homophobia and Transphobia since May 17, 2007. Since 2008, the entire month of May has been dedicated to developing educational and communications actions that promote respect for free sexual orientation and gender identities as an exercise of justice and social equity with the proper name of Cuban Days Against Homophobia and Transphobia. In total harmony with this, our constitutional text recognizes sexual and reproductive rights, prohibits discrimination against people with non-heteronormative sexualities, protects family diversity, and clearly regulates marriage as a legal institution to which all people can access without discrimination of any kind. Of course, there is a long way to go. That is why they are we are educated for love and respectful coexistence, not for the per perpetuation of relations of dominance or violence. We are educated in humanistic and democratic principles 
that are inspired by the emancipatory paradigm of socialism in freedom as a complex individual and collective responsibility. We will continue working until we achieve all justice. Thank you so much. Signed, uh, Gretel Morante. That is the message from the FMC. And we will post this message on our website and our Facebook uh, so that you can also reread it uh, because it's a very good statement. So at this point, I would like to introduce Moon Vasquez, who is my um, very good comrade and sister um, who I've traveled many times to Cuba, uh, attending many meetings of, uh, with other lesbian and uh, bisexual and transgender people in Cuba, Moon. Thank you very much, Cindy. I feel the same way about you. I've been, I've had the honor for years to travel with Cindy and build a long lasting relationship in the Cuban revolution, modeling it. So this afternoon, I am pleased to, um, to share with everybody in more depth, the collaborations, lesbian and allied project, and some of the issues that form our world. Formed a decade ago, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered women from the US and across Cuba have worked in alliance to build bridges across the US blockade. During these years, women in the US have learned so much from the LGBTQ social network of Cuba, which models the Cuban revolution's contemporary vision that supports the advancement of women's lives, including the, life, the fight against homophobia. I refer to you now to the slide that talks about our, uh oh, one second, because I just lost my paper. <laughs> um, bear with me here. Okay, maybe I'm gonna need the slide to be taken off. Okay, here I am back again, let me, okay. Um, this is only my second webinar that I've, I've been, you know, uh, part of, so I haven't gotten my rhythm down yet. <clears throat> couple more, I'll be okay at it. Okay, our vision is, I lost it again, Amy. Maybe take this, okay, I'm back. Okay, our vision is to build bridges of dialogue and education and strategies in the context of our work to end the US blockade and to create deep and lasting ties in the LGBT community of both countries. Our collective strategies is to educate and network, sharing strategies of, on our work and expanding the base of our support, supporting, uh, sharing history and networks and sharing our mutual work. We have, we have had great success in spite of great challenges. Together, we've held a groundbreaking international summit in Via Clara at, at El Mahunje, a historical cultural center for the LGBT community. This was a pivotal point in forming the work that we've been doing in this project. We hosted Is Isel Ocosta for a month long national speaking tour here in the US. Isel is a nurse from Santiago de Cuba and she is the founder of Las Isabelas. Isel traveled extensively across the US to places like Bozeman, Montana, Spokane, Washington, New York City, presenting the work of the lesbian, bisexual, transgender women of Cuba. She visited health clinics, gay community centers, meeting with BABES, a group that supports women living with AIDS, speaking at rallies, attending the Dyke March and the Big Gay March in Seattle. She has, 
She had the honor of representing Cuba, traveling down the West Coast with Pastors for Peace caravan that was, the caravan was actually on its way to Cuba. Cell visited, uh, and traveled with them, also presenting along the way, ending up in California. Then she went back to Cuba after well over a month of being on the national speaking tour that was sponsored actually that was sponsored by the collaboration. The Lesbian Allies Project has presented together at women's conferences in Havana, at the at LASA, the Latin American Studies Association in New York, as well as Seattle, Montana, Chicago. Well, we're just gonna say across the country, we have been talking and presenting the lesbian project over the years that we've that we um, started the project we have written and published articles in the us and in vancouver canada with our comrades up in canada deb and i went up and presented the project as well as cindy and i went up with a couple of the members at the time um camila um, our friend Brown and also Michelle Clark, we went up there. US, the US delegations to Cuba have prioritized meeting with Cinesex, the Center for Sexual Education, the Federation of Cuban Women and their staff and with lesbian groups, especially like Cindy was saying, Santiago, Havana, Sin Fuegos and Trinidad. Our biggest challenges during this time has been the U.S. blockade against Cuba. This has created a huge barrier for us to organize and push our project along. The blockade interferes with the freedom to travel between our countries and generates a huge amount of disinformation. Um, Social media has been compromised. Cuba is blocked from using Zoom, which is controlled by the US. No Zoom to Cuba. So we cannot have meetings as such that we are having today. And um, the US telecommunication industry um, cost an enormous amount of money for phone calls to and from Cuba. Call Calls are up to a dollar a minute. So it's very pricey to call Cuba and to continue to do our work. Other media platforms such as Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp are made cost prohibited for Cubans. As I said, up to a dollar a minute, expensive minutes go by really quick. And okay, as well as communicate as we all know, communication is the access to the key of organizing. It has been very difficult to organize. I'm amazed as much work as we've done and as accomplished as we have gotten in this project with the barriers of the US blockade against Cuba. Under the new administration, we are optimistic that things will change between Cuba and the US for a better world between both countries. And in my closing, I also want to talk a little bit about the current work that we're doing. We're working on a, sh on a booklet and a short DVD of lesbians sharing stories on the strategies and the accomplishments, describing the work that we're doing and, the, and working towards a future of genuine LGBTQ plus rights and freedom in the world without homophobia. This booklet and DVD, it will be available in hard copy here in the United States. My mistake, it will be available in hard copy in Cuba. And here in the United States, it will be available in DVD. Um, also, many of our goals have been realized in this wonderful work that we've been doing since the beginning of collaborating with Cuba. And we still have a long way to go in other areas of our work. 
I really thank you for um, being here this afternoon and really for being interested in the LGBT movement between Cuba and the US. Thank you so much. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, move on to presenting Olympia Diaz Olgas. She, as she reads uh, one of her poems via the um, video, okay? Because we cannot use Zoom, she has to be on video, okay? Olympia is the co-founder and the coordinator of Phoenix, the lesbian group from Sin Fuegos. She is an artist, a longtime activist, an organizer, a mother, a partner, and most importantly to us, she is a dear friend and a sister. She has contributed to the collaborations work for years, and it is a member of the Lesbian Allied Project. Her poem that she's gonna read for us is Te Invito, okay? This poem is an invitation to sensitize, to share, to unite, to invoke, to make better changes in the world. Olympia was inspired to read this poem in these difficult times about a world living during a global pandemic. Domestic violence has been unleashed in particular during these times of quarantine. It is an extremely dangerous and it hurts. Governments must take a serious stance to end of this violence, which in its own way is a pandemic as difficult as COVID. Hence, you will notice that Olympia in her hand has a mask. I also, now we will watch the video. Thank you. Mi nombre es Olimpia Díaz Borges. Soy la coordinadora provincial del proyecto Fénix de mujeres lesbianas y bisexuales sin fuegos, Cuba. Hoy quisiera regalarles uno de mis poemas que se conforman de tres en uno solo. Los voy a leer escalonadamente para ustedes. Se llama Invitación. Te invito y no es una cita. Acompáñame sin bebidas. Reflexionemos aunque la sed agriete mi garganta. No aguanta más mi corazón. Grito, clama justicia. Juro para iluminar el mundo, alcanzar el arco iris. Se necesita amor sin armas. ¿Por qué tantas personas buenas se van tan pronto? En tiempos de pandemia me enojo. Y aunque haya paz, maldigo. El odio cubre nuestras casas. Grito, juntémonos, diversos, raros o diferentes. Es ahora, tenemos que hacerlo. Aunque se, no queden lágrimas, abracémonos, sensibilicémonos. Mi palabra revolución. Me duelen mis hermanas, mis amigos, hasta los desconocidos. Oigo las noticias que mueren en todos los países que sufren. Hay campañas por los derechos que siguen vulnerados. El mundo sigue clamando libertad para mi gente y yo te invito por amor. Reflexionemos por justicia, con respeto, re-evolución. Le sigue, te invito y no, acompáñame, reflexionemos. No aguanta más mi corazón, clama justicia. Para iluminar el mundo se necesita amor. ¿Por qué tantas personas buenas se van tan pronto? En tiempos de pandemia, y aunque haya paz, el odio cubre nuestras casas. Juntémonos, diversos, raros o diferentes. Tenemos que hacerlo, abracémonos, mi palabra revolución. Me duelen mis hermanas, mis amigos, hasta les desconocide. Oigo las noticias, en todos los países hay campañas por los derechos. El mundo sigue, sigue clamando y yo te invito, reflexionemos con respeto, revolución. Y el otro, el tercero, es una cita sin bebidas. Aunque la sed agriete mi garganta, grito, Juro alcanzar el arco iris sin armas. ¿Por qué tantas personas buenas se van tan pronto? Me enojo 
maldigo, grito, es ahora, aunque no queden lágrimas, sensibilicémonos, revolución. Me duelen mis hermanas, mis amigos, hasta les desconocidos, que mueren, que sufren, que siguen vulnerados. Libertad para mi gente, por amor, por justicia, con respeto, revolución. Okay, now I have the privilege to present Deb Goldman. Deb Goldman has been my friend for many a years, okay? She's a member of the steering committee. She's been involved in our work since 2012, has traveled to Cuba with the collaboration on two occasions. She is a retired nurse who her main focus has been women's health both locally and globally. And with further ado, I would like to pass the floor on to Deb. Thank you, Deb, and thank you, everybody. Thank you, Moon. Um, so welcome, everyone. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're already running a little behind, which I think is pretty normal. So we'll just go ahead and get started. And as you heard, with this section, we will start with a video. Um, from Norma Guillard, our dear and longtime friend and colleague, activist and Afro-feminist, with whom some of us have worked and played for over 25 years. And we'll follow the video with a live panel discussion with two Cuban and one US panelists. Um, we've already mentioned more than once about the blockade preventing us from being able to share live um, So we have this video that Norma graciously uh, did for us, especially for this webinar. Briefly, uh, Norma started her activism at age 15 when she joined the Peasant Literacy Project. She has a degree in social psychology and has spent years researching, teaching, publishing articles and audiovisuals and leading efforts to mainstream feminist issues of gender, race, racial discrimination, and HIV AIDS, leading to different national and international congresses. She helps coordinate a group of lesbians called the Remy in Havana and helped develop other lesbian groups in other provinces where she maintains advisory ties. Norma continues to preside over a research section on issues of gender identities and diversity in the Cuban Society of Psychology and from there carries out her activism as an Afro-feminist in various spaces in society. We are honored to present you with Norma Guillard via video. Enjoy. Afrofeminista, activista, y eh, desde mi infancia eh, puedo comenzar casi a hacer historia porque vengo de una familia en la que había integrantes, lo mismo de la prostitución, que gay y que mi padre siempre desde pequeña nos enseñó a respetar. Realidad que eh, luego me motivó a buscar y conocer un poco más del tema. Y es ahí donde ya graduada de psicología, eh, dentro de mis enfoques, comencé a trabajar en el tema de género y diversidad género, identidad y diversidad. Y desde ahí, desde esa sección que dirijo la Sociedad Cubana de Psicología, eh, comencé en una participación bastante cercana al tema, ya que por el abordaje de las identidades, eh, profundizamos en la identidad sexual. Y pude vincularme al Centro Nacional de Educación Sexual, donde se iniciaba un proyecto que eh, permitía ¿no? tener un grupo de mujeres 
eh, lesbianas y bisexuales, ese grupo eh, llamado Orenis, pero que a su vez, como también hace activismo en el Centro Nacional de Prevención del VIH, pues tenía otro enfoque con los temas, en este caso directamente con los que Y ese proceso eh, fue evolucionando de tal manera que eh, hoy por hoy ya se ha creado una red, una red que agrupa a todas las muchachas, a las lesbianas de diferentes provincias que no dejan de tener eh, vínculo también con los grupos trans eh, y también con actividades que, que promueve el, el Centro de Promoción de Salud que también trabaja el, el, todo lo, lo relacionado con el cuidado de la protección del VIH y que está eh, con historia un poco vinculado a estas temáticas. En la, el, este tema, eh, en Cuba no podemos decir que existe un movimiento, sino que existen redes, redes de trabajo, redes con proyectos como eh, el Alma Azul, que agrupa a, eh, trans, a transvestis, transexuales, transgénero, para hacer su trabajo, y redes de mujeres lesbianas y bisexuales. En esta etapa ha habido que buscar una manera de funcionar bien parecido a un movimiento por el hecho de que las limitaciones que ha traído como consecuencia el COVID ha hecho que eh, lo que funcionen sean fundamentalmente los espacios, los sitios, en WhatsApp, que se hayan creado grupos y estos grupos se entrelazan, y estos grupos comparten, eh, intercambian, intercambian sus saberes, pero también a su vez no podemos dejar de tomar en cuenta que a través de la historia eh, Cuba tuvo posibilidad de vincularse con organizaciones internacionales y hemos podido participar en eventos de liga eh, buscando eh, también transmitir experiencias y estas experiencias pues han podido ponerse en práctica ya no solo a nivel de las provincias sino a nivel del país existe un proyecto eh, de aprendizaje, para decirlo de alguna manera, pero aprendizaje de cómo manejar eh, todo este tema que radica fundamentalmente en el Centro Nacional de Educación Sexual, pero que el Centro de Promoción de Salud mancomunadamente eh, van haciendo trabajos que están relacionados con eh, todo el desarrollo de este tema. En Cuba, cuando vamos a hablar de funcionamiento de un movimiento de la comunidad LGBT y no podemos verlo como se ve en otros países. Eh, nosotros tenemos nuestras modalidades. Eh, realmente acá lo que existe son eh, proyectos diferentes que abordan el tema. Eh, por ejemplo, Existe un proyecto de mujeres lesbianas afrofeministas eh, que se reúnen en un espacio desde el punto de vista, a veces buscando en lo cultural y en ese, en ese vínculo lo mismo participan mujeres lesbianas, bisexuales, que transexuales, que travestis. Existe otro espacio. Eh, como um, podemos encontrar eh, el de la se llama Casa Tomada Casa Tomada está compuesto por dos mujeres lesbianas eh, que igual fundamentalmente desarrollan afectos eh, comunitarios porque están en un barrio de Marianao y ese, en ese espacio también confluyen de forma eh, en forma de alianza eh, participan gays, participan 
eh, lesbianas, bisexuales, transexuales, es decir que eh, vamos encontrando que eh, el, la tendencia de nuestro futuro, eh, yo la visualizo como esa búsqueda de esa alianza para hacer trabajo de empoderamiento, de crecimiento, eh, de superación, pero siempre eh, en forma de, de alianza. Asimismo existe el grupo eh, Transcuba, que eh, es un proyecto grande que abarca eh, trabajo con los trans de toda Cuba y vuelven a, a volvemos a ver ¿no? que son vínculos que se proyectan fundamentalmente con la promoción de la salud sexual enfrentando los temas de VIH, SIDA, pero a su vez también eh, haciendo eh, relaciones con otros espacios también con el objetivo del crecimiento y el desarrollo. I hope you enjoyed this video from uh, Norma. She's our wonderful friend and uh, partner in solidarity of feminism and Cuban uh, revolutionary work. So we're going to now uh, uh, introduce the panel. So I'm going to briefly introduce each one of the panelists and give them a chance to tell us a little bit more about themselves. So. I'd like to start with Adai. Um, do we have all the panelists in view now? I'm just going to wait for a minute for all of the panelists to get on. I see two. Dai, are you there? I don't see Dai. E. Um, if one of you could, oh, now I see her name. Dai, e. can you put your video on? There she is. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sorry, it's the connection. Yes. Um, okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, good afternoon to everyone. I'm Diane Nistamayo Preval, but everybody calls me Dai. I'm Cuban and have lived most of my life in Santiago de Cuba, where I was born. And professor in, in Mexico. I have been at GIQ Plus uh, rights for 20 years. I'm one of the founders of Las Isabelas, the social network that has been working for the rights of lesbian, bisexual, and transgender women in Cuba. Um, I would like to say that is a tremendous honor sharing with you all today. Thank you very much, Cindy Domingo, Luna Vasquez, and all the amazing women of the US Collaboration Group. I'll be glad to learn from you all and to share some ideas from my experience as a Cuban activist along these years. Thank you. Thank you, Dai, and welcome. We're so glad that you're able to join us on this panel. Thank you. Okay. Maidi, would you like to introduce yourself? First of all, thanks for inviting me over. It is a pleasure to be here. I have been in some ways involving LGBTQ plus issues for about 15 years. I've been part of Las Isabelas and Oremi groups. I came to Mexico to study in a master's program and I, um, and I haven't been in Cuba for almost two years, but I try to keep in touch with everything what is happening in the island. Thank you, my D. We're happy to have you as well. Both of these women are great friends of the U.S. Women in Cuba collaboration, and we highly value our close relationships with them. So thank you. And then I want to introduce um, Dr. 
Marie Beth Velasquez, affectionately known as MB. Welcome. Thank you, Deb. Hi, hi everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. What an honor and so inspiring to see the work that's already been done. I am first generation American born Filipino American, born in San Diego and grew up in the state of Washington. And I have done my medical training all at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, New Mexico and family medicine. So my advocacy work has been through the medical context mostly. Currently I serve as a faculty advisor for the Queer Medical Student Association at the University of Washington and doing some work with the curriculum, trying to reduce bias in the curriculum as we are still invisible. Um, LGBTQ people are just not as present. So it's disheartening to see how doctors are being trained with that as an absence. So that's where much of my work is outside of medicine. Well, outside of that job, I also serve on the board for the Women in Medicine organization, which is a nonprofit started by a handful of lesbian physicians in 1984 and have been meeting annually since then. So it's exciting to see this work and I'm looking forward to more collaboration. Thanks so much for adding your voice. And um, MB is not only my good friend, but she's my partner in marimba music. <laughs> so. Yes, absolutely. Shout out to our instructor that might be out there, Dr. Claire Jones. Okay, thank you. So let's go ahead and start with the first question. Um, Dai, would you be uh, willing to go first? I'll ask the question and I'll have you give us your opinion. And the question is, based on your work and experience, what have been some of the significant barriers and achievements in advancing equality for lesbian and LGBTQI communities in your country? The barrier in advance or gender equality I, you know, Dai, you might turn off your camera. Maybe your identify the poor education. Um, so, um, the, um, should I start from the beginning? Sure. Okay. So I was saying that as a barrier in advancing gender equality, I identify the poor education of the general. public about sexuality and gender issues. Gen um, general public, I also mean the people in charge of political and social processes, lack of knowledge, which leads to the persistent discrimination in terms of sexual orientation and gender identity. But in spite of the barriers, uh, the LGBTQI plus community has faced over many years is implied that there have been significant achievements like um, the recognition and support given to social networks that address the LGBTQI plus issues. This support has been on the side of CNSX, the National Center for Sexual Education, and some other organizations as it is the case of the FMSA, the Federation of Cuban Women in Santiago de Cuba. In this sense, is a very important achievement and counting with allies like the Lawyer Social Network, the Health Cuban Ministry, and the Cuban Cosmopolitan Community Church, with, which um, has been a strong LGBTQI plus community by developing a remarkable activism of the community. For instance, Cinesex became international day the 
against homophobia, which falls in the, in the um, 17th of May. And Mariela, let's uh, about the, thank you. Thank you, um, Dai. Um, you were breaking up a little bit. I'm not sure we caught everything you said, but um, I think we got the gist of what you said. Um, Maidi, do you have anything to add to that? I agree with what she has said. Um, I also think that the machis intrinsic mach machismo in the mentality of Cuba it's a huge barrier and therefore in the mind of their leaders, the people who have the power to make decisions. It can be observed in low levels when we, for example, ask for a place to make a meeting, a group meeting. Sometimes uh, people react well, but sometimes they, uh, they give excuses and so forth, not uh, helping us in, in setting a meeting or, or whatever we were trying to do. Um, religion, I, I was trying to not repeat what that you just said. Uh, religion is another issue. Uh, conservative Protestant religions in particular are maintaining campaigns uh, against communities, uh, LGBTQ rights. Uh, they have a uh, particular campaigns against equal, equal marriage because they defend the family, or the original family model. You can see uh, posts and in very places of the city that they try to, to post. And I mean, it, it has been uh, a huge barrier. In achievements, well, the Lesbian Women Network itself is an achievement. And the fact that we wor work closely with other uh, networks. The new constitution, it says that all people are equal before the law, receive the same protection and treatment without any discrimination based on, based on sex, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, ethnic, ethnic origin, etc. And the, the achievement that it is the first time that the term gender identity have been used within the, the given uh, provision of principle of equality. In the article 82 says that mar marriage is a social and legal institution and one of the form of organization of families. It is based on the free consent and on the equality of rights, obligation and legal capacity of the spouses. The laws determine in what way it is constituted and its effects. However, that law, I mean, there is still no law to regulate that particular article. And one, that's one of the, of the things we are still fighting for to, to get that law that allows uh, equal marriage. Uh, try not to repeat what you just said. Oh, uh, recently there was a, an important one that I think is a very important one achievement is that recently a kid that has two moms uh, has his official identity documentation with the, his two moms. She is uh, an American and, she's, and the, his, her wife is Cuban. They were married in the state and they inscribed the, the her kid in the state and the Cuban government recognized that they are both the, the mothers of the kids. Nice. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate your input. Um, I think we have similar issue here in the States where the support we get tends to be from the um, medical, scientific community, civil rights groups, and the opposition tends to be from the religious groups as well. So, um, okay, MB, would you? Yeah, what? just <laughs> to echo all the points mentioned in the sense of marriage equality, super important you know, to be present and equal with our heteronormative counterparts, um, parental rights, hate crime legislation and anti-discrimination 
legislation in the workplace. So we are slowly chipping away here, but then barriers are, you know, when an, a different administration steps in that may not have those same beliefs or support for equal rights for LGBTQ communities, you know, that risk or that realities of being stripped away from those rights. So we are, are still needing to solidify those. I think vis visibility is a huge key that needs more of that. Um, we're getting accountability in there with the hate crime legislation and anti-discrimination, but visibility, even something so small, um, like in medical school, when I started the LGBTQ people in medicine chapter at UNM, for National Coming Out Day, we would have a large banner and you know it was decorated really nice because we are <laughs> the greatest with glitter and paints and rainbows, right? But um, we even had allies. We invited allies to come and sign this banner that was later posted. So vis visibly, you know, heightened in the uh, climate of seeing, oh, wow, they have a lot of support and signatures on here. And for the students themselves in the LGBTQ community, like how great that felt to be supported in something where their voice has been heard. So I'm looking forward to having more opportunities to increase visibility and voice. Right. So I think one thing that impresses me about Cuba is it seems like as you work on equality, um, you make progress. But like MB says, every time we have a new administration, it seems to change. And our current occupant of the White House has managed to get three people uh, on the Supreme Court. And so now we have a six conservative to three liberal judges uh, or justices. And so there's some possibility that they may start chipping away at some of our rights. In fact, last month they heard a case on adoption. Um, this was, let's see, Fulton versus City of Philadelphia, a case on whether private religiously affiliated foster care agencies may refuse to work with same sex couples. And with this new majority, they're leaning towards um, the religious affiliated agencies and siding with them that they can reject uh, the right for LGBTQ people to foster children. Um, so it, it feels like it could be the beginning of an attempt to chip away at the rights that we've spent the last five or six decades building. You know, our constitution in 2015 allowed for legal gay marriage all throughout the country. So. Anyway, is, is there anything else anybody wants to add to this discussion? That it's hard to hear that, what you just said. Yes, it is. But we will continue to fight. Um, and like MB said, um, be out there and be visible. And we sure appreciate the support that we give each other. Those, you're the groups in Cuba and, and here. One point I'd like to make is, yeah, we do. We get rights, they're taken away. Just like Deb said, under a different administration. So it's sort of this, now you have it, now you don't. Now you have it, now you have it, now you don't. So it just, it, it's heartbreaking. And, it, and our work is doubled and tripled in the, in the years that, you know, and the decades that we've been organizing and trying to have a movement that really accomplishes what we set out to do and that we continue to have our rights. So <laughs> we're hoping that under this new administration of well, four years, <laughs> anyway, go ahead with your next question, Deb Goldman. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so the next question, um, Madai, maybe you could start with this question. From your perspective in advancing lesbian and LGBTQI rights in your country, how has intersectionality, example between racism, sexism, homophobia, you could add age, economic 
uh, situation, et cetera. How has it been addressed and what are some areas still needing work? There are many groups in different sex sectors. Each group have focused on their own agendas and activities. Um, nevertheless, time to, to time, it, how, how often it depends of many variables, but time to time, uh, there are meetings and workshops where they discover results and plans and so try to to look for how to, to work together to, to toward the problematics as a whole thing, looking for ways to helping each other. No, uh, because we want rights for everyone, that it, it's each person, each individual have the same opportunities, no matter what. I think I think I think that we need to work on is with the general public. And in the and with the higher levels of, of the government, I mean, as activists, we participate in community affairs, try to attend meetings in schools or workplaces. But for bigger impact, it is necessary to to have either resources or access to broadcast media to to you know, to, to get to the general people. And it, that's something, that is something that some, sometimes it's hard to get. That's my opinion about it. Thank you. Um, so, um, Dai, would you like to add to that? Yes, um, well, um, the theoretical and methodological approaches to intersectionality suggest that social differences uh, such as race, biological gender, and sexuality are not mutually, mutually exclusive, but rather relational, right? Interconnected and interactive. Uh, um, intersectionality also centers on contextualized systems of power and reveals how inequities and inequalities give meaning to and in that way produce social differences and how uh, unequal circumstances and injustice mark and codify social experiences. Um, taking this into consideration, uh, the National Lesbian and Bisexual Women Workshops held every year in Cuba, uh, Cuban provinces, consider this agenda topics related to violence, emphasizing on the lesbian couples' violence in this case. Um, the activities are mainly didactic ones in order to get the participants involved in, with this topic and uh, as to empower women on their rights as women as such and as lesbian or bisexual or transgender. Within these workshops, discussions uh, and debates, which are even based on real life experiences take place and it's been addressed as a topic, um, as a topic the persistent, I mean, uh, inter internalized homophobia as an important stressor in lesbian and bisexual women. Um, on the other hand, as Norma Guillard uh, made reference in the video, there are different social cultural activities about uh, Africanism and race in which um, everybody can participate to learn and exchange about history and culture in terms of race and uh, different forms of discrimination by this mean. So this is mainly what um, it's done by the, LG, in this case, by the lesbian and bisexual women group in Cuba according to my experience as an activist. Right. Well, I appreciate both of your input. Um, it's very impressive to me how well organized you are across the whole country with so many groups working, not only um, supporting each other socially, but, but educating each other and finding ways to then educate the general public on these issues. Uh, it is very impressive. I think I feel like here in in the U.S. we don't have we're just not as well organized in that way. And I know it's it's a bigger country, but I think we could learn a lot from what you've done with your network. Um, MB, can you answer? Hey. 
question? Yeah, you know, I, (laughs) (laughs) thanks. Intersectionality, this flag behind me, um, the Progress Pride flag to include our black and brown, you know, brothers, sisters and gender non-conforming as well as nodding at the gender expansive trans community and all of this together, um, both ends of that spectrum with age. For the youth that are gender non-conforming or <clears throat> expansive, we have gender affirming clinics now to assist you know, in consent and discussion about how to go about that care with legal representation available to help with documentation, changing um, forms of ID to put that together. And on the other end of the spectrum for our seniors who are aging, um, Seattle has now, will be opening up the Gen Pride for Generations Pride, affordable LGBTQ affirming senior housing, which is truly addressing the issue of social isolation uh, that has been leading to poor health outcomes. So I'm proud about that as well as at the medical school, some of the students decided they want a queer and trans students of color group separate from the mainstream, again, to identify and share that camaraderie of the marginalization that occurs, you know, with all of their different identities. Where do we need work? Is it, are you going right into areas that still need work? Yeah. Um, well, you know, disappointingly there, I've noticed some intra-community conflict and loss of solidarity. And this goes back to transphobia. Uh, I think it stems out of perhaps a fear of lesbian erasure and, you know, thinking that by supporting our trans community that the rest of us don't get the prioritization or energy and attention they need. It's almost parallel to the Black Lives Matter movement, it feels, when, you know, here we are supporting Black lives that are being taken um, at astronomical rates unjustly. Some people feel threatened about that. And I've heard them, you know, debate saying that, no, all lives matter. And we're not saying that all of our community members don't matter when we go to support our trans and gender expansive community. And I feel it's so important um, because of the increased violence. It's a public health risk. Just already in 2020, there's been 40 uh, deaths, which is above last year's and mostly um, black and Hispanic trans women. And this goes mostly unreported or misreported. So not even prosecuted. This is terrible. And I know that as an LGBTQ community, We've seen this before. We've been through that. In medicine, we have a saying, see one, do one, teach one. And that is seeing a procedure, you know, as a student, you see it done. And then further along in your training, you get to do that procedure. And later on, you actually get to teach it. And I feel like in our LGBTQ community right now, this is an opportunity for our gay and lesbian and bisexual um, brothers and sisters and siblings that we have watched how to move from a you know marginalized state and not saying it's not gone but you know we're definitely better than we were decades ago and so we've done that and now it's the opportunity to create solidarity and amplify the voice of the trans community and gender non-conforming because it's time. The tension is there, you know, we're losing lives and I feel like any dissonance in our community cannot be sustained if we are all to project our, you know, advances socially and politically together. I agree. I'm just I'm wondering from one of the Cuban um, journalists, um, do you face similar issue where there's kind of this tension between the trans community and the lesbian groups?
Sometimes, but there are. I'm, I don't. I don't see it as, as a whole problem. I mean, there could be in, in a media. There could be some issues, and there can be some this. I don't know how my English is not as good as that is. <laughs> it's fine. Um, yeah, sometimes it's hard to to get to an to an agreement in which both parts or all the parts involved are satisfied. But we talk and we get it solved. Or and that and if we don't, we let it pending for the next meeting. But we try to to work together. And it's, of course, sometimes it's, it's hard because each one have their own needs and their own agendas, but it, it works. It, it is get done at the end of the time, at the end of the of the meeting of the whatever we were, we were doing. Right. I mean, this could be a, another whole webinar discussion. I think there's definitely a place for lesbians to be able to meet. Um, but I think that it's important that we support the trans community as well. Any, any other thoughts on this? You know, just if I may, recently um, in the, on the Women of Medicine board that I sit on, because the organization was started in 1984, the mission statement and vision statement specifically identified lesbian women, lesbian physicians. So it was very specific. And now that we are in an age that we are seeing more of the spectrum, we had a dialogue to change that statement. Now, and I, this is what I would propose, think about how this uh, sits with you. We changed it to a network of lesbian, sexual minority women and gender expansive physicians committed to each other's professional and personal growth in a feminist space. So that I'm really proud of how the founders took the time to have this conversation with us and feel like we haven't lost a thing and we are even a bigger, happier family. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, Let's see, this question, uh, there's a specific question for the two Cuban panelists and one for the, for the US panelists. So um, whoever would like to go first for the Cuban group, please describe for us the Evoluciona Campaña and how LGBTQI groups in the different provinces are collaborating with this campaign and dealing with gender-based violence, especially with regard to the LGBTQI community. Um, well, uh, the Evoluciona Campaña is a Cuban initiative that keeps on working uh, to inquire and remodel the beliefs that support violence against women. Uh, this campaign is led by the center Oscar Arnulfo Romero in alliance with the Federation of Cuban Women, the National Center of Sex Education and the Center of Youth Studies. The campaign seeks to influence young people into questioning norms created by the patriarchal ideology uh, that place women at a disadvantage of power. All along the island, there are posters about the campaign. I've seen them in Santiago and when I was living in Havana as well. Um, there is an important work in addressing violence against women, which includes workshops to the LGBTQI plus community and the scheduled visit to educational and working centers in order to discuss about the topic with the goal of raising awareness about the persistent violence against women and the importance of reporting any form of violence. For instance, in Santiago de Cuba, Las Isabelas has a strong link with the campaign and has done a relevant work by participating in talks and discussions with young people at the universities or in public places as part of the celebration of special days, as for instance, the International Women's Day. And not only in educational institutions, but even in hairdressers, since they are places very visited by women. So there is um, um, a significant work um, related to this campaign. That's great, great to hear. 
Um, we're, we're running kind of late here. So MB, would you like to answer this question? What have been your experiences and concerns working with groups that deal with gender-based violence, such as the Me Too movement or other groups? And what has been most effective in preventing uh, gender-based violence in your LGBTQI community? Mm. Yeah, again, this is raising awareness and zero tolerance of trans exclusionary or transphobic behavior. For women's movements, um, going back to the grassroots, I think we were talking about this with Moon before. If we think back to when women took their voices and power back and remembering Take Back the Night, uh, 1978 in San Francisco, and uh, it started to spread campus wide all, across all universities and became a momentous shift that women are saying no more. And on top of that, just a few years ago when the new administration took office, the day after we had a women's march that oh, it attracted over 7 million worldwide on all seven continents that really showed solidarity and strength in numbers. And then as you mentioned, the Me Too movement uh, that October 15th, 2017 is supposedly it started catching on by Alyssa Milano, a celebrity making the suggestion of if all women that had been, you know, the victim of sexual harassment or abuse displayed Me Too on their social media accounts. Wow, that really caught on and it was a bold statement and accountability, back to accountability of social behaviors and changing the culture of objectification of women. What moves me about that movement as well is I saw our male counterparts and maybe non-binary as well that were starting to hold others accountable for you know, behaving badly towards women or showing disrespect and objectification. We started to see men, back to thinking about the macho, you know, images, we started to see them standing up in the workplace. And we, we saw accountability of very powerful men being, you know, brought toward the legal system for being held accountable for their behavior. So this has been phenomenal seeing that women are making, you know, their presence and their voices be heard and their presence known. So back to that uh, vis visibility um, and what this group is doing. You know, I'm always excited to see more groups that are taking this on. Right. Thank you, MB. Um, in some ways, you and Cuba are light years ahead of us. Um, Gretel Marante from FMC and her statement that Cindy read talked about, you know, educating people, uh, you know, sexuality education throughout the island, s starting in the 1970s. And we're so not there. I have to say our state of Washington, which is a little more progressive than many states, just passed the first in the nation in this last election, a state um, bill, which, um, expects all schools in the whole state of Washington to uh, provide sex education in schools, kindergarten through high school, um, with a, a emphasis on development of interpersonal and intrapersonal um, communication skills. And hopefully that in some ways, this will help to reduce these issues of gender-based violence uh, in the future, at least in our state. And hopefully this will be a model for other states that could take this on. So, um, well, we're running pretty late here. It's almost 3.30. Um, shall we take a few questions or what do you think? What I would like to suggest now that one of the most important thing, the outcome of this webinar is to see where we go from here. How do we work together? So what I'm gonna ask the three panelists, if you guys can write your answers down 
email them to us. We'll look at it. We're going to integrate it into our work. And hopefully you, Dai, Madi, you'll continue to work with us. And be, maybe you'll join our work too and yeah. stuff. For, so I'm going to pass it back to Deb. Thank you. Well, I'm so grateful. We all are so grateful that you're willing to take the time to be on this panel for this very interesting discussion, which, I mean, we could go on for, for days discussing these issues and, and sharing and comparing. Um, so thank you. Um, and like Moon said, if you would uh, write up your ideas about how we can work together um, and build synergy um, towards these issues, that would be great. And we'll, we'll... <laughs> so um, uh, I hope that you'll stay, maybe we'll go over for a few minutes and just try to answer a few questions. I'm going to turn this over now to um, another one of our uh, National Steering Committee members, Nataka. Actually, oh. actually, Deb, we don't have time for Q&A. Oh. Um, yeah, and so we've decided not to do the Q&A. Um, if if uh, the speakers, if the panel has any closing, brief closing statements, and then we'll move to our closing. Yeah. OK, thanks. So, um, any closing statements? Um, MB, let's start with you this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's gratitude, truly. Just seeing that there are people signed in or watching, having the panelists here. And Maida, by the way, your, Span your English is much better than my Spanish. So <laughs> don't get, and that's true. Um, but, you know, again, thank you for having a forum to have the conversation. And I, I am looking forward to hopefully being more involved and seeing where this goes. Great, thank you so much, MB. Your input has been so valuable. Okay, uh, Dai. Well, definitely, I think that working together is uh, the key. This is power. I mean, in, in other words, unity is a strength, right? And thus exchanging, exchanging experience uh, like in this webinar is a way to socialize a work done by the two nations in terms of LGBTQI plus uh, communities. So thank you very much. And I will write down what are my ideas concerning what it could be done in terms of improving, improving and having a better world for everybody in this planet. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dai. We are just so happy. And I, I hope that we can get to go to Cuba soon and meet up again. And congratulations on uh, the work that you're doing in Mexico on your PhD. That's wonderful. OK, uh, Madi. I just uh, like to say thank you for inviting me and come to me anytime. I am available for you anytime you want. And it's a pleasure to work with you to try to improve what and change what needs to be changed in our societies. Thank you so much. And we look forward to many more years of working together. And congratulations to you as well. I understand you're almost finished with your uh, master's degree work. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. OK. I'm gonna turn it over now to Cindy. Thank you all. And it was so wonderful, especially to see our two Cuban comrades. I haven't seen you for a long time. And nice to meet you, MB. Always nice to meet another Filipino American uh, uh, <laughs> activist. So um, of course, uh, you know, our work is about lifting the blockade and educating people about uh, US Cuba relations. So uh, our webinars would not be complete unless we have an action program. Uh, and uh, Amy, thank you for putting on the screen um, ways in which you can support and become active in our work. So join us in our work, sign up for our e-newsletters, sign up on our Facebook page under US Women in Cuba Collaboration and our website, womenandcuba.org. Uh, hopefully we will be able to travel next year um, 
We don't know if we'll be able to bring a International Women's Day delegation, but we'll see where we're at. Uh, participate and follow the work of our Lesbian Allies Project. And uh, we will place notices of our next webinar on the role of Cuban women and other women around the world in the battle against COVID-19. Second of all, uh, we would hope that you can join us in, our, in the Saving Lives campaign, which uh, is a US-Cuba-Canada collaboration in fighting COVID-19. Uh, listed there is a website. You can check out information. This is a very important campaign. The pandemic is by definition, de definition global. And what became so clear to us is that Cuba has always had a global perspective when it comes to healthcare. And because the pandemic is global, it is necessary to put aside political differences, to call on all medical collab expertise and to call on international cooperation in this fight against COVID-19. In the United States, as of yesterday, two people are dying every minute in the United States. Over 14 million cases in the United States and growing, continuing to grow with the worst still to come. Cubans are currently 56 times less likely to contract the virus than people in the United States. And Cubans are 76 times less likely to die from the virus than people in the United States. We are organizing to allow US, Cuba, Canada, medical, clinical, and scientific collaboration to provide direct medical assistance and or to provide advice and guidance in treating COVID-19, as well as collaboration in the development of vaccines. Cuba is now developing, is uh, on a, uh, trying four, uh, is in the development of four vaccines and the blockade is impacting the ability for Cuba to obtain the resources for the further, further development of the vaccines. Ending all US economic and travel sanctions against Cuba, including the attempts to stop all other countries from accepting Cuban medical brigades and assistance in the battle against COVID-19. Um, in this campaign, uh, you can join committees, for the medical resolutions and media committee, and also endorse the campaign to show its broad uh, support. Thirdly, support the campaign to get the Nobel Peace Prize for Cuba's Henry Reeve Medical Brigade for their role in providing healthcare around the world. So um, these, this medical brigade, which is, has been sent to many countries around the world, has played a decisive role in fighting HIV AIDS and um, the Ebola uh, virus in Africa. They have dealt with natural, they have sent brigades uh, in the natural disasters. And uh, since, COVID, since the development of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, they are in uh, over 40 countries. Uh, Italy has just requested another brigade. Uh, Italy as a developed country is requesting aid from Cuba in the battle in the second wave, uh, a worse wave of the pandemic. So we hope you can join us there. Lastly, both our organizations are part of both WILF and the US uh, uh, Women and Cuba collaboration are part of the US Cuba Canada Normalization Group, which is going to hold a national conference next year. This is the largest coalition ever in the United States that has been that has come together to lift the blockade. We know that this is a new administration coming into power in uh, January. And uh, the Biden-Harris administration has already said that they will return to the Obama-Biden policies, opening up travel once again and uh, beginning to open some aspects of trade. However, we need to lift the blockade. It is 60 years old now and has created an inhumane uh, situation for the Cubans and also uh, curtails our ability to build relationships with Cubans. There is a important potential with the new administration uh, to do this work in terms of making significant breakthroughs and ending the blockade. However, 
in this last couple of weeks, we have seen that the administration uh, under Trump, which has had only harshened the blockade over the last four years, uh, and the and given even more power to the anti-Cuban movement in the United States, that there is once again uh, growing media coverage and manipulation of um, uh, manipulation of the media to spread uh, falsehoods and misinformation about what is happening in Cuba. Recently, there, were new, uh, there was news about um, a small hunger strike and a movement supposedly uh, that's called the San Isidro Movement. Uh, and um, the US media continues to manipulate the facts to lead people to believe that there is a continuing crisis of human rights in Cuba. We want to say that it is up to the Cubans to deal with inter their internal issues. While, many, while some movements have legitimate concerns, we also uh, do not agree with the United States policies, long time policies to intervene in the issues of, um, of, of Cuba. We want to adamantly say that WILF and US Women in Cuba, uh, Cuba uh, collaboration uh, are in support of the Cuban revolution. We reassert once again that the US needs to have a policy of non-intervention in Cuban affairs. Secondly, that there should be non-financing of people and movements that have, um, uh, that have uh, concerns over Cuba policies. And there is a long history of the US uh, USAID and the State Department funding movements and people uh, to create, to try to create uh, and destabilize the Cuban government. And as in our mission, we, we want to reassert that the, we need to have respect for uh, the self-determination of the Cuban people. We, we want all people to look at the facts uh, you look at what media outlets you are looking to when we uh, when you are researching what's happening in Cuba. Look at the facts. Look at the sources. Um, you know that's the problem with social media, is that uh, there is a lot of misinformation, and the United States media has not ever been a friend of the Cuban Revolution. So please make sure that your information is accurate. So with that. Uh, we want to thank you all for coming on again for this very important webinar to thank our friends, MB, Dai, Maidi. Great to see you. And of course, uh, we will po be posting this on YouTube and our Facebook so that the Cubans will be able to, to also view this. And thank you again to the Federation of Cuban Women in, in building relationships with women here in the United States and women in Cuba. Good night.